So you know what's more exciting than a lawyer teaching you? An accountant. An accountant. <laughs> That's pretty bad, isn't it? Have an accountant and a lawyer all on the same day. You know how you can tell the difference between an extroverted accountant and an introverted accountant? An extroverted accountant stares at your shoes instead of his own. Uh. I know. I'll be here for three hours. What? <laughs> Good, I needed a nap. Good. Good. Yeah. Hopefully we can keep it interesting. Taxes is a hot topic. So, usually it's there's some interest in this topic. With the presidents nowadays, huh? Yeah. Yep. And then uh, that'll be, this'll be, we'll talk about this for two hours. And it goes by pretty quick, I promise. <laughs> no, I'm not buying You're not buying it? <laughs> And then the third hour, we'll talk about job costing and estimating. OK. Um, Actually, you want to see the tax thing. The what? I want to see the tax thing. I don't hardly pay out anything. It's all labor. So I get to more options to dodge taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have to put this on here. Nothing that I say can be considered tax advice. You have to speak with your individual tax accountants to get advice on your specific situation. These are all generalities. These are all principles that can apply. But before implementing any of them, I'd definitely talk to your accountant, your tax accountant. Okay. A lot of this is basically like a book report. It's on this book here, Lower Your Taxes, Big Time. Got the book right here. This is the book. And it's by Sandy Botkin, who used to work for the IRS. So he knows a lot of the secret ins and outs Right? And he puts out a new book every year with every new tax code, updates his book a little bit. This is for 23 and 24, so it's the latest version. All right. um, the great thing about this book is that anytime that you have a question about anything, whether it's applicable to you or not, there are references at the back of the book or in the, at the end of each chapter that references tax code or tax cases, things like that, that make the, the laws what they are. Okay, So there's a reference to everything. And if you need those references, I recommend getting the book, taking a look through that, and uh, finding those references there that you can take to your accountant to research. and figure out the best way to implement those things. Right? On we go. First we'll talk about financial statements, then tax myths, tax return basics, entity types, mill deductions, vacation deductions, income shifting, car and truck deductions, home and office deductions, and then investments and tax. All right? A little bit about me. I owned a landscape company. I got my bachelor's degree in horticulture. And I owned a landscape company. I did design. And then I managed installs. Acted kind of like a general for landscaping. I subbed out everything and oversaw the subs for all the installs. And we did a lot of big jobs. Like... 
million dollar residential jobs. And we did block, we did swimming pools, we did a lot of outdoor lighting, planting trees by crane, water features, all kinds of fancy stuff. And I loved it, it was great. And I did that for about 15 years and never really understood what was going on with my money. I always was struggling with cash flow and was always behind on trying to make all my payments. Had to juggle money to make, cap, to make payroll and to get my subs paid. And it was really kind of ugly. And I know that a lot of companies in the construction industry faced the same kind of struggles that I did. And I solved all my cash flow problems by selling three more jobs. Because if you can sell three more jobs, you can get three more down payments. If you have three more down payments, that can float your previous jobs for a little bit longer until you can get paid on them, right? So all that came to a head in 2008 when people stopped doing million dollar landscapes. And I ended up bankrupt. And that was utterly humiliating because here I'd been so successful with the landscaping that I'd done, but financially I was really struggling. So I went in a few minutes, a few months later to get my taxes prepared and the accountant was chatting with me. We were talking about taxes and we got on the topic of my bankruptcy and how that was going to apply to my taxes for the year. And he looked up at me across the table and he said, yeah, I'd seen that coming for several years now. And he'd said nothing to me. I was furious. And I realized at that point in time that that's actually more the rule than the exception. Most tax accountants get you in, they get your taxes prepared, they send you on your way. Rarely do they stop and take a look at your financials or explain to you what's going on with your company financially. Rarely do they give you any kind of advice on how to handle tough times or things like that. And I wanted to be an exception. I wanted to be the person that helped out the industry and helped them understand a little bit about what was going on with their financials and help them to be able to be financially healthy. So I ended back up in school, did my MBA, took all the upper level accounting courses so I could sit for the CPA exam. I worked four years doing audit focusing on construction and then the whole time I was in school and working I was focusing on how to solve the problems that I had while I was a business owner in the construction industry. Right? So everything we're teaching today is a result of my studies and the experience that I've had with working with construction companies. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. So you know who's teaching you today. We'll start off with financial statements. So tax savings actually begin with your financial statements. If you don't have accurate financial statements and if you're not looking at them frequently, you're kind of tying your accountant's hands as far as tax savings. Because that's where all the tax savings begin is with the financial statements. Okay, So who here has monthly financial statements prepared that they can review? Yeah? Great. That's awesome. Definitely an exception. Awesome. And does he go over them with you? Yeah. What's that? Does he go over them with you? <clears throat> when, not really. He just prints them off okay. to me and emails them to me. 
Okay, that's a great start. That's a great place to start, okay? Hopefully you can start implementing some of these strategies that we'll talk about as you review those. Um, for those of you that don't have monthly accounting statements, I highly recommend that you find somebody that can prepare monthly statements for you so that you can stay on top of your financial health because what you don't track is left up to chance. What you do track, you can grow. Okay. Let's talk about some tax myths. Tax myth number one, I didn't make a lot of money this year, so I don't need to know about tax planning. Okay. One of the great things about taxes, there are very few of them, but one of the great things is that if you have a loss this year, it can carry over to next year. Which means that if I have a $10,000 loss this year because I didn't do very well, that $10,000 can be a negative against my taxes the next year. So I have to pay taxes on $10,000 less next year when I do really well than this year. Okay, so it's important to understand these kind of things and understand a little bit about taxes and tax planning because it all starts with you and your planning and your activities. Okay, so even if you're not making a lot of money, you do need to know a little bit about tax planning. Okay. Myth number two, my home-based small business has to have a profit at least three out of five consecutive years. Who's heard that? You heard that before? It's called the hobby law, the hobby rule. If you have a business that you're running more as a hobby and you're not making money on it, you're just funding your hobby and trying to get tax savings from your hobby, then they, the, ta the IRS won't allow that. However, even though for the hobby law, the rule is you have to have a profit three out of five years, if you are running a business like a business and keeping records and that's your, your income, your sole income, then you don't have to have a profit three out of five years. Okay, so that is a myth. Number three, my accountant or spouse takes care of my taxes. A lot of times in the accounting industry, and I don't know if that applies for you guys as well, the spouse of the, the business owner is doing the books and the bookkeeping. And so the owner is very hands-off, doesn't do much with their finances, and therefore doesn't understand a lot about what's going on with their taxes. You, again, you've got to understand what's going on with your company if you want to save money on taxes. Okay. Number four, tax knowledge won't save me that much money anyway. <laughs> That's a big one. Everybody thinks that they're going to pay what they're going to pay and there's no real way around it. Well, there are two different tax laws. There's one for people that don't understand the tax law, and then there's one for people that do understand it. And the tax law for the people that do understand it is a lot more, you can save a lot more money than you can by just letting things happen the way they happen, okay? So education is important. That's kind of the moral of the story here with these four tax myths. Okay. Any questions on these? No. If you do have questions, please just shout out. Uh, online as well. If you have questions, please just shout them out and we'll, we'll get them answered. Um, make sure they're on topic though. A lot of times when I'm teaching tax, people will ask some personal 
question about their specific situation that has nothing to do with the topic we're discussing and kind of gets us off track. So stay on topic there. OK, tax return basics. This is what a tax return looks like. OK? So this is how you do a tax return. We start off and we figure out all of your income. And all of your income goes into one little square on the tax return. OK? Ultimately, I mean, you add it up from other places, but ultimately ends up in one little square. Then you have all of your deductions. Your deductions are your different business expenses and costs, but then also other deductions allowed under the law. Okay. Then you have what's called your adjusted gross income, which is your AGI, and it is your income minus your deductions. Your AGI, or your adjusted gross income, is what you're going to pay taxes on. So we want this number to be as low as possible. Okay. Next, there's a tax table that we reference that we'll look at in the next screen. And that tax table tells us what percent tax you have to pay on for your taxes for that year. And it's all based on where your AGI is. So the more money you make, the higher your percent for paying taxes. We really like to punish people in this country for doing better. <laughs> so the better you do, the more percentage you pay. Okay. So the tax rate we've picked here is, one, is 22%. So we do 22% times the 9, and that gives us $1.98, roughly $2 in taxes. Okay. Last, we have credits. And credits are a dollar for dollar match on your taxes. So in other words, if we have $1 of credits and we have $1.98 of taxes, the total payment that we have is 98 cents, about a dollar. OK? So the question here is, would you rather have a deduction or a credit? Which would you rather have? Deduction. <laughs> yeah, the answer is going to be credit. OK? Up here, we have a $1 deduction. Down here, we have a $1 credit. Right? This $1 deduction only saved us, let's see, if we, had, uh, if we had to pay 22% on all $10, we would have $2.20. Okay? So this $1 of deductions that gets us down to 9 saved us 22 cents. Okay. How much in taxes does a dollar credit save us? One dollar, right? That's why we want credits more than we want deductions. Okay? But the credits are harder to come by. Unless you're young and you have kids still at home. Then there are some great credits that they have that you can get for your taxes, OK? Um, this is also how you get a refund. Obviously, you can't get a refund by having more taxes, because if you get this below 0, you're still going to have a percentage of 0, which means you just pay 0 taxes. You're not getting any money back. But if you had, say, $3 in credits, you'd be getting a dollar back as a refund. So that's how a tax return kind of works. Of course, there's a lot of paperwork for every one of those lines and a lot of details that you have to go through. But this is the basic of how it works. Okay. Here's the chart I was talking about. 
You can see the 22% means that for if you're a single filer, that you have income between adjusted gross income between 41,000 and 89,000. If you're married, filing joint, it's between 83 and 178. If you're a head of household, it's between 55 and 89. Okay. So that's kind of how that chart works. Okay, different entity types. Who here is a sole proprietor? Yeah? Okay. How about an LLC? I'm an LLC filing as an S Corp. Okay, so you're an S Corp then. Okay. Is that, are you guys S Corps? Yeah. Yeah? Awesome. Okay. So, a sole proprietor, or sorry, these different entities are treated differently by, by depending on who's looking at it. Okay. If you're looking at legal liability, they look at it one way. If you're looking at it from the IRS point of view, they look at it another way. Okay. So as far as legal liability, a sole proprietor or partnership is the same as it's just you. Okay. There's no separate entity. It's just you. Which means that any time that you do work, you run the risk of losing anything that you own. So if you own a house, you own cars, anything like that, if you have a retirement account, any of those kind of things are liable to be taken if you get sued. Okay? So we highly recommend against being a sole proprietor or partnership for that reason. Wait a second. I was, uh, I was saying... Isn't a sole proprietor and an S corp kind of the same thing? No, sole proprietor means that I want to start a business, so I just go out and I start working. That makes me a sole proprietor. Then, then I'm gonna, I just transfer this to my account, and I, I'm gonna think I'm an S corp. I was an LLC. No, an S -corp. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. If you file different, yeah, and you have to file with the government two different ways. Mm -hmm. did. Yeah. I mean, Good. Now you can only be one of those. You can't be both, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. You're either one or the other. Right. The the tricky the tricky thing is that when in order to become an S corporation, you either start out as an LLC or as a C corporation. That's exactly what happened. And then you file to be allowed to be an S corp. Correct. That's what happened. Okay. So that's the kind of tricky part. But ultimately, it all ends up as an S corporation, regardless of how you started. Okay. So limited liability S corp and C corp all have protections, asset protections, so that they can't legally come after your personal assets. Okay. Um, the IRS, on the other hand, treats the first four as it's the same as you, okay? If your S corporation makes a dollar, the IRS considers that you've made a dollar, okay? Whereas with the C corporation, they treat it as a separate entity. When a C corporation makes a dollar, it's the C corporation that's made the dollar, not you. So it's treated a little bit differently. The tax return's a little bit different. And there's a p potential for double taxation as a C corporation. Okay. We won't get into a lot of details about that, just so that you know it's there. Okay. So we're going to skip through these quickly. Um, I want to take a look at S corporations because S corporation is the best way to save money on taxes. Okay? Sounds like you're all already there. But some of the advantages there's no double taxation like there is with a C corporation, but you can still be a corporation. Uh, you can eliminate up to 50% of your social security and Medicare. We'll talk about that. 
in a second. You can do income splitting. Uh, has specialized management. There's limited liability. You have ordinary loss on the sale of stock for your company. Use of corporate losses. Limited benefits from self-insured medical plan. And 50 to 100% exclusion on gain from qualified small business stock. Plus it's a pass-through entity. Like I was saying earlier, that means they treat you as the business. The, the IRS sees it as one and the same. Okay. All these others are different tax implications or just benefits of running the company. Um, they say severe limits, but it's, it's fairly easy to become an S corporation. You just have to uh, fit the state statutes. Um, limited ability to raise capital. It's a little bit harder if you're a sole proprietor or you're an LLC. Somebody can just donate to the company and you can just write a new article to amend your current articles that says that they're now partial owner of the company. Whereas with an S Corp, you have to deal with stock and the trading of stock and it gets kind of tricky. Um, yeah. Well, the rest of those we won't chat them all. Okay, so why an S corporation? Uh, the key to saving social security taxes is that with an S corporation, you pay your self-employment tax on wages, salaries, and bonuses, but not on dividends. Okay, this is why you're an S corp. You pay yourself as little in salary as possible and as much in dividends as possible. Okay, so there's two ways to be paid from a company, a corporation. The first way is wages. You're an employee of the company, you get paid wages, you pay your FICA, you pay your Social Security, you pay your Medicare, all of those taxes come out. Then the business has to match all those taxes and pay those as well. No, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you want to limit that as much as possible. Pay yourself as little as possible. Okay. The other way is to pay yourself dividends, which means that you're paying yourself from the profit of the company. Anytime that you're a stockholder, you can be eligible for dividends. If the company declares a dividend, then you get dividends based on your percentage ownership in the company. Okay? So here's the example. John has a net income of 80,000 from his S corporation. If he receives this amount in salary, all of it would be self subject to self-employment tax at 15.3%. So he'd pay $12,240. If, however, John pays himself a reasonable wage of 40000 which is the term that the IRS uses, reasonable wage, and takes the other 40000 in dividends, he would save 15.3% on the 40000 in dividends. In other words, he would save $6,120 in taxes. Okay. That's why you're an S corporation. Not because your accountant said you'll save taxes and so you should do it. Okay, this is why. Okay, let's talk about some mill deductions. I have a question about that. Yeah, go ahead. So if you're only setting your wage at 40000 a year uh -huh. and then pulling and paying Social Security on that, that's kind of going to screw you when it comes to Social Security. Right. Yes, it definitely can. The, the key there is they say that it has to be a reasonable wage. Mm -hmm. So my accountant says that reasonable wage, you can take the state average, that's the reasonable wage. 
So whether it be 40,000 or 60,000 or whatever, whatever your position is based on the gross income is what a reasonable wage is considered. That kind of, that's how it was explained to me. You may think differently, but that's, that's how I was told. She told me. That is one way to do it. Yeah. See, this, that's why I was confused because this is the first year I'm going to be filing taxes as a, as a corporation. I mm -hmm. was an LLC and then my accountant said to switch me over to the next court. Okay. So I'm just I'm new with it and all, but when I pay my employee too, I, said, I, have to, I pay taxes on top of taxes. It's crazy. But yeah. At the end of the year. Technically, you don't pay taxes on top of taxes. It's their taxes, like their taxes come out of their paycheck, but I have to and match. then you have to match. Yeah. So you do pay taxes, but you don't pay double, because half of it's coming out of their paycheck as withholding. But I pay, but I pay also my own taxes. Right. For your own salary. Yeah, but I have, and then I have to pay my employees' taxes. That's where you. That's where you have to pay both of those. But with the employees, technically, their portion of the taxes comes out of their check. So even though you make the payment for them, it's still coming out of their check. Correct. So, you know. It just feels like it. It does. It does. And it hurts to write that check to the IRS every week or every two weeks or however often you pay. It hurts. Yeah. Okay. Did, did that answer your question? Did you have other questions on that? Yeah. Okay. Mill deductions. All right. Who here has heard that mill deductions are completely gone or that you can only get 50% for them? No? Nobody's heard that? Awesome. Because it's not true. You can get full deductions for your meals. There are qualifiers for getting full deductions for meals. Okay. The whole so, push. Here. Go ahead. What? What? I know this might be. What is Biden trying to do with sell with like us? Like people like us with taxes, I heard. I heard he's trying to do something. You know. No. Um, we don't really know for sure, and there's a lot of discussion about it that we probably shouldn't get into. Yeah. But. Um, yeah. Tip. Typically, a Democrat in office tries to tax the wealthy more than they tax the, the wow. small business. Yeah. But what they define as wealthy usually includes us, a lot of the middle class, uh, especially the small business owners. So. Will you put a number on that? A number on what? Small business, when you say, when you say that uh, Biden's working for smaller people or whatever. What's the, dollar, yeah. what's the dollar amount for, for, that, for, 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 for that separation? Usually. 200,000, 500,000? No, 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 no. It's usually like 80,000 and below. That's usually the target because a huge portion of the country fits into that 80,000 and below percent. So they keep wanting those people to pay more taxes? No, usually, and again, not everyone that makes more than that. Yeah, again, I, I don't know his policies super well. Yeah, he's gonna get the hell out of there. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, so the moral of the story with the tax with uh, most tax in most tax savings is you've got to use a tax diary. A tax diary doesn't have to be a notebook or something that you write manually in. You can use apps. Like for meals, you can use something called Expensify. And you can enter all of your meals into there and enter in all the information that's necessary that we have right up here. 
And if you record all that, then you can take that to your accountant and you can say these meals qualify to be deducted 100%. If you don't do that, guess what your accountant's going to do? When you turn in your taxes, he's going to find the line where it says meals and he's going to take that completely out and add it back into your to your total income. So you're going to pay that much more in taxes. Okay? So you've got to help your tax account out by keeping a tax diary. Okay? In that diary, you have to keep a receipt if it's over $75. A picture of it is, is good enough if you're using an app like Expensify. Okay? Uh, you have to keep record of who was entertained, where did the business meal take place, when did the business meal take place, why did the business meal take place. This is probably the most important thing. And you have to uh, be very specific about it. So don't just write referrals. Write, we discussed getting more business by networking with each other. Something like that, okay? You have to put what type of meal was involved, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and how much did the meal cost? Now, though you only have to save a receipt if it's over $75, a receipt that you keep answers most of these questions for you, okay? So it's not a bad habit to keep pictures of your receipts. Well, I just keep, I just keep all my receipts for the year in the box. Yes. That is a nightmare for your accountant. <laughs> you have to have something written down, all this information, if you want to get well, these yeah, deductions. When you go into, your, when you go into your, your taxes, I do that by just saying, like, I, I just keep all my receipts in the box for each year. Yeah. Yeah, it's better to use an app or to get a, a diary, an actual book and a notebook of some kind and staple them into there and write this information down. Really? Yeah. Because again, saving money on taxes is not your accountant's responsibility. It's your responsibility. If you want to get these meal deductions, then you need to keep track of it. And you need to be proactive and go to your accountant and say, hey, look, all these meals qualify for 100% deduction. Because your accountant's too busy during tax season. They're not going to take the time to come and ask you which meals were deductible. Can't you just give them a number? Yes, you can. But if they're preparing your taxes, they have some liability there. Right? Because they're saying what can and can't be deducted. And without any kind of proof or something to back it up, they're really sticking their neck out there by saying or by just writing down what you tell them. Right? If it goes to court, they have to be able to defend it. Does that make sense? Yeah. When I was talking to this. Yeah. Anytime an accountant is doing your taxes, the number one thing on their mind is how do I keep from going to court with this? That's what they're thinking about. Don't you have liability as well? Don't you get 25% of the fine if we get? Don't you have to bear that burden too? Um, I mean, there are repercussions that can be, that can be taken against accountants. I'm not sure exactly what the percent is, but there are definitely repercussions. Like you can lose your license. So they can make claims against your insurance, things like that. Okay. So help your accountant out. <laughs> Keep a notebook. Uh, things that you cannot deduct. Entertainment with clients and prospects. Year-end party for your customers. 
golf spa or sporting event or theater with your customer. Entertainment is pretty much out now. Okay, but you can still save on meals at entertainment. Okay, these are 100% deductions. Meals with clients or prospects, meals with business partner, officers or directors, meals while traveling outside of a normal commute, meals while traveling away from home or over, overnight, employee meals for convenience of the employer, employee meals for required business meetings, meal paid for at a chamber of commerce meeting or other similar meeting, or food that you keep in the office, like donuts and coffee. Okay, those are 100% deductible, any of those items. Also, urine party for employees and spouses, a team building or recreational activity with employees, meals for general public at marketing presentation, if you're doing a big sales thing, Food at an open house when selling property. Or food as a cost of goods sold in your business. That would be if you're like a restaurant. Okay. One of the best lines you can learn is house business. If you say that to your customer or they can say it to you, then you can always reply with, business is great, however, I never have enough business, I never have enough referrals, I never have enough clients, boom. And now qualifies as a 100% deduction. Okay? You have to keep record of that on your receipt or in your tax diary if you don't keep the receipt. Lunches for staff, 100% deductible if there's a short lunch period generally no more than 45 minutes in length. The employees are available for emergencies. Those are like ambulance services. Or if there's insufficient eating facilities nearby. So if they're clear out in the boondocks somewhere and there's no meal options for them, you can purchase it and take it out to them. And that's deductible. Okay, country clubs and health clubs. This is a tricky one, and it's kind of dumb the way to get around it, but here's how you do it. You can get a deduction for these kind of clubs if the company reimburses the employees for the dues to the extent that they are used for business as a working condition fringe benefit. In other words, you cannot deduct a country club membership anymore. However, one of your employees, say a salesperson for your company, can go get a membership at a country club and then they keep records so that they keep record of when they're golfing and when they're taking other people golfing so you can separate personal and business. And then say it's 50% business, you can now reimburse that employee for 50% of their country club dues. Does that make sense? So you can't just buy a country club membership, but you can reimburse people for their country club membership to the extent that they use it for business. And there have to be records kept on it. Okay. What if, what if your corporation buys into that? Does it doesn't matter? Doesn't matter, yeah, doesn't matter. But however, if you're an employee and you get a personal country club membership and you keep track of how many times you go golfing with clients, then you can deduct it or you can reimburse yourself for a portion of it and it's deductible, okay? So it's a little tricky twist. It's kind of dumb. I don't understand why they allow for these kind of loopholes, but they do. Okay, vacation deductions. Um, again, use a tax diary. 
you got to get a receipt for all lodging. You have to document your pre-existing business intent for the trip. In other words, so you... like an actual vacation or a vacation for your business? Yes, to both. <laughs> You can actually turn a personal vacation into a business trip, and that's what we're going to talk about here. There are some little tricks to do that. Okay. The big thing to do that is you have to have a business intent ahead of time. So you have to have something that you plan to do for business ahead of time before going on your, your vacation. So I'm going to Hawaii to look at a job. Yes. And then vacation as well. Yes. Yeah. But you have to spend some time doing business. Or you're having your corporate meeting in Hawaii. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you yap at your wife for 10 minutes and you're done. <laughs> yep. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. The amount that you spend daily for such things as transportation, meals, and lodging, you have to keep in your tax diary. You have to keep your dates of departure and return home from each trip and the number of days spent on business while away from home. You have to keep record of where you traveled, described by the name of city, town, or small designation. Similar designation, not small. You have to document why you traveled, including the business reason for your travel or the business benefit derived or expected to be gained. I have to be as specific as possible. And it's the 5149 test for US trips, conventions, and seminars to deduct all travel. In other words, 51% of your time has to be spent doing business. 49% can be pleasure. Okay. So it's the four hour and one minute rule. If you're working for four hours and one minute, the rest of the day can be play. Okay. So that even, that could even count like if you're working on your laptop, right? Sure, yeah, you bet. You just have to plan it in advance and you have to make a, a note in a calendar or in your tax diary, you have to make a note that you're going to do that at this time when you're on vacation. Gotcha. You have to note that beforehand. Because if you do it after the fact, then it's not considered tax deductible. Okay. So you've got to be there for the purpose of working. Okay. You, okay, so let's talk about the term business travel. The IRS uses the term business travel. And you are on business travel, according to the IRS, when you are traveling from home overnight or for a period of time sufficient to require sleep. So you don't have to sleep, but it would be a period of time that would require sleep. So if you're traveling overnight, then that would be included. Okay. Transportation expenses are those costs that you incur in getting to and from your destination. That's pretty obvious. On the road expenses include all costs necessary to sustain life while on your trip. So that includes lodging, meals, laundry, dry cleaning, and other similar expenses. You can deduct 100% of on the road expenses. You can deduct 50% of your meals while you're traveling. And you can deduct zero entertainment that does not involve prospecting or business motive. Okay, So you can't go to Disneyland and say that that was business. Unless you're having your, unless you're having your business meeting at a pavilion in Disneyland. OK? With your wife. With your wife. You bet. But you have to, again, document that ahead of time. Uh, you can take your spouse if she is licensed in your business. Or 
if she can make you money at the convention or on the business trip. So you have to be creative about deducting her costs, right? There are. It's a lot of stupid tricks. Again, they leave all these loopholes open for all their for all their rich business buddies, right? Shit. All the shady people. That's right. Okay. Um, you can make your weekends completely deductible if you have business on Friday and on Monday, or if it's a Monday holiday or on Tuesday. Okay? You can make those days deductible. That means that you can deduct all on the road expenses for the weekend and holidays which again includes lodging, meals, and dry cleaning, those kind of things. Okay? You count travel days as business days. So if you're flying to somewhere on Friday and you're flying home on Monday, Monday and Friday are both travel days, which count as business days. Combine fun with business day. If your presence is required at a particular place for a specific and bona fide business purpose, that day is counted as a business day, even if your presence is required for only part of the day. Okay, so back to the Disneyland thing. Right? If, your business, if you are required to be at Disneyland for a me meeting that you're having at Disneyland, then yes, you can deduct that. Uh, again, a seminar or convention you can attend and consider as long as you're in that convention for four hours and one minute, then it counts as a full day. Okay. There have to be at least six hours scheduled and you attend at least two thirds. If a meeting is canceled or a flight is canceled or something like that, <clears throat> it's not your fault. It still counts as a business day. So if you have a meeting planned in advance somewhere that you're traveling to and they cancel that meeting when you get there, it still counts as, as business travel, even if you don't go to the meeting. Um, yeah, you can visit colleagues to improve skills and referrals. You got to make appointments in advance and document it. Again, tax diary. You can hunt for a job anywhere in the US. The IRS allows deductions for all expenses directly related to a search for employment in the same trade or business. So you could go interview with somebody in Ohio, have no intention at all of taking the job, but still counted as a business day. Okay. Do what you can do and try to make it through it. <laughs> All right, back to exciting stuff. Oh boy. <laughs> Income shifting. Okay. Um, a medical reimbursement plan you can't really do if you're an S corporation. Since you guys are all S corporations, we won't cover that in a lot of detail. Basically what it is is you can set up a self-insured medical reimbursement plan and hire your spouse and then cover your your spouse's health or your family's health concerns, you can reimburse for them for up to a certain portion and it's still deductible. So 
It's one reason to not be an S corporation, but not enough to counteract the savings you get by not paying all the social security. So, Hiring your children. Wages paid from a parent to a child under the age of 18 are exempt from social security and unemployment taxes. Okay, so that's one good reason to hire. The second is the first 12,950 of earned income is tax-free because your child receives a standard deduction of that amount on their own tax return. So if they're working, they have to file a tax return. However, they get a standard deduction, which everybody can take, of $12,950. At what age? There's a tax court that says you could hire a child at least seven. Up to 18? Up to 18, yeah. Uh, I got it. So basically, anybody that you want to give money to, instead of giving money to them, you can hire them, and then everything that you pay them is tax deductible. Huh. And as long as it's less than $12,950 that you pay them, then they won't pay taxes on it either. So if you pay a nine-year-old more than that, they have to pay taxes on it at that year? Yeah. Yeah, and there's a kitty tax law that can come into effect too that makes them pay taxes at your wage rate, or at your tax rate rather than their own. Okay. So if you have kids that play sports and you're financing their sports, this is a great thing to do. Hire them, pay them what you would normally pay them, pay for their sports, and then that's tax deductible from your account. Okay? Little trick. There's some considerations when you are hiring children. There's nine factors the IRS uses to examine wages for reasonableness. They're all listed right there. Basically, they're determining whether your child is actually an employee or not. So they got to be paid. A reasonable amount for the work that they're doing. They got to keep track of hours, um, duties performed, volume of work, type and amount of responsibility. The complexity of the work is considered. The amount of time required for the work. General cost of living in the area, ability and achievements of the employee, which are going to be very few for children. Comparison of amount of salary with amount of business income. So if you're only making $10,000 and you're paying your kid $12,000, then that'll be thrown out. And then the pay history of the employee. You've got to track the date worked, a description of tasks and the hours worked. You should approve the time. Payment to your spouse or children should be by check, or it can be direct deposit. That's considered check as well. And you have to have your attorney draft up an employment contract, okay? Just to keep everything above board and to keep the IRS off of your case. You've got to be able to stand up in court. Gift and shift tax. Okay, so if you have property that you want to give away, you can give it to a relative in a lower tax bracket than you and then they can sell the property one day later and pay the tax at their bracket. Okay. So if they make less money than you and you make more money and you're going to sell something, a piece of equipment, rather than you selling it and paying tax on that at your rate, instead you gift it to somebody else. One day later they can sell it and they pay the lower tax rate. Okay, so that's a way to save a little bit of money. 
Uh, if you're single, you can gift 16,000 per person tax-free. 32,000 per person if you're married filing joint. Again, kitty tax. The first 1150 of unearned income is is qualified for the standard deduction. The next 1150 is taxed at the child's income tax rate and above 2300 is taxed at the parent's rate. This is for unearned income, like selling selling things like that. Okay? So this is all, all this slideshow stuff is going to be emailed to us? Yes. So. Yeah. So you can read through the boring stuff over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gift leaseback technique, give away a property you own to an individual or to an irrevo irrevocable trust and use an independent trustee. Then you give away property, you want to give away property you've depreciated completely. Do not give away property that would produce a deductible loss if you sold it. And then you pay a res reasonable rent to use the property. Okay. So again, if you want to give somebody some money, rather than just giving them money, you can give away the property to them, something that you've fully deducted, say a truck. You want to give your kid your truck, and then you pay rent to them for using the truck. So you still use it, it just has a different owner. Okay. Okay, this is a really cool one. You can deduct 100% of your real estate. Normally, you can only deduct the building on the land. Okay. And it gets depreciated over 39 years. However, when you purchase the property, you divide the title between the land and the building. The building is in your name and the land is in a trust for your children. Okay, so there's a different title on the building than there is on the land. And then you lease back the property from the trust. And the reason you can do that is because then you can deduct the land as well as the building. Car and truck deductions. This is the number one audited business expense by the IRS. So you got to be careful on tracking your mileage. Again. So if you write off, if you write off a truck, you can't track your mileage, correct? That's not true at all. No, like if you write it off, depreciate it. If you depreciate it all the way, yeah. you can still take deductions for mileage. Yeah. yeah. There's actually two ways to do that and we'll talk about it. But again, tax diary. You've got to keep track of mileage. I use something called Mile IQ. It actually tracks my, my drives and then puts them in a list for me to qualify them as either personal or business. And then I don't have to write down in a log somewhere the mileage and, and the start odometer and ending odometer and, and the reason and all that. I can track it all in my app. Okay? And there are several apps like that. This one's called Mile IQ, the one that I use. Doesn't do it completely for you. You still have to, what it does is it says you had to drive from here to here. Is this business or personal? And then you swipe left if it's personal, you swipe right if it's business. Pretty easy, huh? Pretty simple. But then that gives you a tax diary. Okay. You need to track the total miles, the total business miles, total commuting miles, and other personal miles, non-commuting. You gotta have all of those areas tracked. Okay, 
So basically every car ride you take, you have to either write it down or you have to book it in an app. Okay? Okay, then you're going to deduct the larger of the actual expense or the optional IRS standard rate. So a lot of construction companies will purchase their fuel with the business account and then that gets recorded in the books as fuel. Right? Same thing with the business insurance, the, the auto insurance is a business policy. The business pays for it, gets deducted as insurance expense. Okay, same thing with uh, repairs and maintenance and car washes and things like that. Okay, you can do that, but then you have to go back and figure out what percent you used it for personal and what percent you used it for business. Again, if you have a tax diary, it does all that for you. And then whatever percent was business, you can deduct, and the rest you have to claim back into the into income. Okay? So if I have $1,000 of tax or of receipts for fuel, and I use my truck 60% as business, I can claim $600 of that $1,000. And I would do that with uh, license and registration. I would do that with car washes. I would do that with repairs and maintenance. Okay, so that's the first way to do it. The second way to do it is the mileage method, which you've all heard about. January to June of last year, it was 58.5 cents per mile. July to December, 62.5 cents per mile. Okay. Um, so what you do there is instead of keeping on your books the fuel, the insurance, all of those items, instead you would take the mileage rate and figure out how many business miles you drove and then multiply that by the 62.5 cents per mile and you would claim that instead of all of those line items on your, on your profit and loss. So that's another way to do it? Mm -hmm. Those are the two ways to do it. What does that mean? It says it cannot be used by corporations. Um, so Referring to like a corporation that owns a fleet of trucks. Okay, so if you personally own the truck, or if or if the corporation owns owns the truck. See, this is going to be good for me because I, I filed an extension. I'm filing my taxes on the twenty eighth. Mm-hmm. But the problem is you didn't track all this last year. Yeah, I did. You did. <laughs> but. Uh, but That's why I say it's all in the bookkeeping. It's all in the record tracking. This year I'm getting the, she said to me, quarter, monthly reports of like my payroll and all my, my expenses. Uh, like I'm, I told her that I, I don't know, whatever I spend out for like groceries and stuff and uh, clothing and stuff like that. She wants me to send it to her in a monthly email. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what she's doing there. She may be trying to deduct some clothing as, as uh, uniforms. Because I did, yeah, because I, I did buy for my business, like logos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, all that's deductible. Uniforms. Okay. All right. 
Is it better to buy or lease? This is a question I get asked all the time. Okay, Almost all the time it's better to buy. The only exception is if you can't get good financing to buy a car because of bad credit. In that case you would lease. If you put on less than 15,000 miles per year, which isn't likely, then it's better to lease. Or if you keep your vehicles for three years or less and trade them in, then it's better to lease. Now that a lot of people do. But not if you're running 25,000 miles a year. Right, right. Well, and, and usually that would be included in the lease, right? You can only have a certain number of miles per year. So there are some leases that have higher mileage. But high enough. Maybe. At least one car and that was it. That was harmless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, employees cannot deduct interest and taxes on a car, but they can deduct the business use portion of their lease payment. So if you have a, an employee that's leasing a car that you're using for your work, then you can deduct the business portion of the lease payment. So either pay all cash for the vehicle or lease the vehicle in this situation. Sell or trade? It's another question I get asked all the time. You want to first compute whether you're going to have a gain or a loss on the sell. Okay. If it's a loss, then you want to sell or trade it. If it's a gain, do not trade it. You want to sell it. You still pay taxes on the trade if it's a trade. Okay, so that's like trading in your vehicle when you go get a new one. You don't want to trade it in if there's going to be a gain. Instead, you want to sell it. Okay. All right, when is the mileage business related? This is the tricky part for figuring out whether you include it as personal or as business. Okay. A temporary business stop is one where you're expected to be for less than a year. Okay, so that's the IRS's term, a temporary business stop. A regular business stop is another IRS term, and that's one you're expected to be there for more than a year. Where you'll stay will be indeterminate. So like a bank. A bank is not a regular or a bank is a regular business stop, but it's not a temporary business stop. So situation one. Your home is your principal place of business. All business stops are deductible. Okay, So if you go to the bank, it's deductible. So you can count that as business mileage. Your home is not your principal place of business, but your business trip takes you outside your normal geographic area of work. Your round trip mileage is deductible. Okay. Situation three, you travel within your normal geographic area and your business mileage to and from your office would be deductible if you went to a temporary business stop on the way to the office or on the way home. So what that's saying is don't ever drive, if you have an office, don't ever drive straight from home to your office. Stop at a business stop first, then go to the office. Then you can consider your drive from home to your office deductible. If you just drive from your home to your office or from your office to your home, that's not deductible. That's a commute. Okay? So. Stop at Home Depot twice a day. Exactly. I hate Home Depot. <laughs> or the bank. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are tax credits for electric vehicles. We won't get into those. Home office deductions. All right, so qualifying for a home office. Post a portion of your home must be used exclusively 
for your principal place of business? Just put a laptop in there and a little desk in the hand. Right, and that's if it's an empty room. If you have other stuff being stored in there or other activities that you do in there, it's not being used exclusively for an office. Sleep in there. That's not being used exclusively for an office. What if you don't have enough space? Then you probably don't have enough space for a home office. I don't know, she said you can, and my account says mine. Uh, follow what she says, do what she says. My house is tiny. Okay. Yeah. So she says as long as you got a little office in your room, it's fine. Yeah. So like if you had a five by five area in your room that you use exclusively as your office, then that five by five area can be considered your home office. Right? Yeah. But you can't deduct the whole bedroom no. No. because you have a five by five area. Okay. okay. So that's what it's saying. It's got to be that five by five area. Okay. Uh, it can be used just to conduct administrative or management activities. You don't have to receive clients there. There's no other office where you conduct substantial administrative activities. That's another qualifier for it being your place of business. A place of business that you use to meet and deal with patients, clients, or customers in the normal course of your trade or business can be used as a home office. A separate structure is not attached to the dwelling unit. A detached garage that you keep all your equipment in. A place to store inventory or product samples can be a an office or part of a daycare business, which none of you are. So what can be deducted? Expenses that are directly related to the home office portion. So if you paint the home office, that's deductible. If you repair a leak in the home office, that's deductible. 100%. Okay. Indirect expenses related to the home in general can be deducted. It's like depreciation, home security system, utilities. Expenses that don't benefit the home office either directly or indirectly are not deductible. Okay. For instance, uh, if you are remodeling your kitchen, that can't be deducted. Can't? Cannot. Yeah. But if you are remodeling your office, that can all be deducted. If you're redoing your roof, a percent of your roof can be deducted. And that's how they figure out, or the way that they figure that out is by square footage. There's a couple other methods too. But square footage is usually the simplest. They figure out your total square footage. So if your office is five by five, that's 25 square feet. And what percent is that of the total residence? That's the portion that can be deducted of the roof. Of the roof. Okay. Same thing with like pest control or. What do you mean pest control? Like pest control, if you have pest control services. You can deduct a portion of that, oh, really? the percent of your home office. Okay. Again, there, there's three methods. The simplest method is to figure out the square footage and then um, figure out what percent that is of your totable, to, totable, that's an odd word of your total square footage of the house. Okay, and then you figure out a percent. Take a yearly dated picture of your home to establish it is used exclusively for a home office. These are ways to audit proof your home office. Okay, you gotta take a picture yearly, keep that in your tax records. You wanna keep records of your square footage 
A great way is the, the tax assessment that comes. You can use that, a copy of that document as proof. Uh, put your home address and phone number on your business cards and other marketing. Have your visitors sign a logbook if you do receive visitors at your home office, which isn't very common for the construction industry. And then uh, keep a work activity log for time spent in your office. So, yeah. Um, Question. Would you say that a detached garage where we store tools and materials is deductible? A detached garage can be, yes. But only the percent of the area that is uh, used for that. So if you use it exclusively for your business, for storing materials and for parking your trucks and keeping all your tools. If it's used exclusively for that, then yes, a detached garage is deductible. Unattached? At attached garage, yeah, is part of the house. So yeah. What's that? Is there a difference in deductions for attached versus detached? No, there's no difference. No difference. Okay. Okay, investments and in tax. <clears throat> All right, there are, when it comes to investments, completely tax exempt, partially tax exempt, or tax deferred. Those are the three types of investments you can have. Okay, they're either ordinary income or fully taxable. You pay both federal and state taxes at your ordinary tax rates on your investments. Okay. Capital gains is a different type of tax. And that's you pay at your normal rates up to a set capital tax gains rate, currently at 20%, plus a surcharge of 3.8%. And if you have collectibles, they have a special capital gains tax of 28%. Okay, so capital gains refers mainly to uh, like dividends that you receive from a company. Okay, they're taxed at a different rate than your normal tax rate. Uh, let's see. So, different investment tax strategies. First one is if you have stocks and bonds, you want to hold them for more than a year because a long term gain tax percent is going to be lower. It's going to be a capital gains tax rather than uh, your regular tax rate, which is a short tax rate. Okay. So you want to hold bonds or stocks for long term. You got to identify the shares sold and pay less tax. Okay. You can keep records on mutual funds. Usually they'll have, uh, uh, it's not a prospectus, uh, um, explanation that they send to you that tells you how your mutual funds portfolio did and what was sold and what was, what was purchased so that you can keep track of things. Uh, don't fail to use tax efficient funds. In other words, if you're going to use a mutual fund, you want one that holds for long term rather than is aggressively trading. Okay. That'll lower your taxes. And then put the right investments in the right accounts. Investments that produce ordinary income go in tax advantage accounts like a 401k or an IRA or a simplified employee pension and profit sharing plans. Okay. Investments that produce little tax or are taxed at long term capital gains you want to put in traditional accounts. Okay, so does that make sense? 
anything that produces an ordinary income, in other words, those like a mutual fund, if you have a mutual fund that is aggressively trading throughout the year, you want that to be in a 401k, an IRA, or a simplified employee pension, okay? As opposed to a long-term mutual fund that they hold long-term, that you just want to keep in a traditional trading account, traditional investment account, okay? So again, it, the big difference is long-term versus short-term. Short-term gains, gains are at your regular tax rate, and you want to keep those at tax-deferred accounts. And then other accounts that hold for long-term, you can keep those in a regular trading account. <clears throat> and the tax rate on those is lower because it's a capital gains tax rate. Okay, if you have a tax advantage account, you do not want to place real estate in it. The reason being there are a lot of tax advantages to having real estate that you lose if you put it into a tax advantaged account like a 401k or an IRA. Okay, instead you want to use an REIT. Um, distributions are ordinary income from real estate. Distributions are ordinary income. No losses are allowed on the sale of real estate. You can't use borrowed money to purchase real estate. You won't get any depreciation deductions and annuities are tax deferred anyway. Okay. These are all reasons to not place real estate or annuities or bond, tax exempt bonds in a tax advantage account. Okay. So you don't want to purchase muni bonds with 401k or IRA. You don't want to purchase real estate with them and you don't want to purchase annuities in your IRA or, or 401k if you have them set up. All right. That ends our second hour. And there's my contact information. So we'll take another 10 minute break.